Hi everyone and welcome to lesson number seven and today we are going to be focusing on creative writing and um, so I'm excited for this because I think all of the work that you've done so far for your fiction analysis work and um, it's about picking apart the skills that other writers are using to create another world that can in be of interest to us as readers. Well, today you get to put yourself in the position uh, of writer and develop some of the skills that you've noticed the other writers have used in order to create and craft your own piece of creative writing. So our objectives for today's lesson, as you can see here, are to craft a descriptive or narrative piece to showcase your ability to create imagery and detailed description. So I will be giving you a choice today for which uh, task you're going to want to focus on, whether you want to describe um, in detail a particular image or whether you want to create a story out of that or a narrative. So this mimics what you would get at GCSE, where you would get a choice over whether you were going to write to describe or whether you were going to write to narrate. And in today's lesson, I'm going to guide you through some of the skills that you would need to develop and to create a really effective and engaging piece of creative writing here. OK, guys, um, so another key word in your objective to really think about before we get going is that word craft. If you are crafting something, it implies that rather like a um, potter or an artist would take their time to really perfect the piece of art that they are working on. And in writing, you shouldn't be rushing. I know from looking at some of your work that you've been sending to me that you, you've done really well with following the analysis guides that, that I've been posting here. Um, However, I think that one of the things that, unless you're guided through it, you might not realise is really important, is that word crafting, to really take the time to reflect on what you've written, to read back over it, and to think about how you can make it more engaging or develop it further. And so all of those skills are going to be super important for the work that we do on your creative writing today, because it should be this process of slowly perfecting and crafting your writing. Right, with that said, let's have a look at the key aims that you will need to be developing for your skills. Okay, so I'm just going to talk you through some of the skills that we are looking for from you with your creative or your des your descriptive or narrative writing. So some of the skills that I'm looking for from you are that you can embed some of those methods that you've been pulling out of other writers' work. Um, so by that I'm talking about your techniques like metaphor, simile and alliteration, um, amongst others. And um, think of those apes stomp techniques and we will be looking at those in more detail in this lesson. So I'm looking for you to be really thinking about um, the strong imagery that you can create, the sounds of the words and how you can play with those to interest and engage your reader. Okay. We're also looking for you to be developing ideas and images that are engaging and interesting. Now that sounds really obvious, well of course any good writer should be engaging and interesting their reader with, with the imagery that they're creating. Um, but we're going to unpack how you can do that and how you can do that effectively in this lesson. Um, so other key skills that I'm going to be wanting to see from you in your writing are that you have that range of really sophisticated vocabulary, that you're taking the time to think about not just um, your word choice, but the right words. How you can actively choose the best possible word to get across the meaning that you have in your head or the feeling that you're trying to create. We're also going to be thinking about your um, variety of sentence structures. So. Just as we have done for question twos on, on your fiction bookler tasks, uh, one of the points that we looked at in one of our lessons was on sentence structures and how they can be used to create different effects. Well, now it's sort of over to you, for you to be able to experiment with different sentence structures yourself and to think about how those could be developed to change pace, mood, tone of your piece. OK, and finally, um, we're looking for a well-structured piece of writing, whether that is your descriptive piece or your narrative, your story writing, that you've thought through from beginning to middle to end of your writing, the shape it's going to take and the direction your, your story or your description is unfolding in. And again, I'm going to talk you through some top tips on how you can do that well. And finally... Um, the, the much maligned spag, so your spelling, punctuation and grammar, this is uh, part of your accuracy of your writing. It is so important that you leave yourself time to be 
free. Even professional writers require editors to go over their work and, and look for mistakes and help them to, to write more accurately. Okay, so there is no shame in spotting mistakes afterwards, but what is important is that you actually take the time to go back over your work and look for any errors and try and correct them. We all have to do that. I still do that now. I have to leave myself time to look for those mistakes. And um, just as you will have to with your writing and just as famous writers do with their editors. Okay, so we're now going to think about what your particular creative piece is going to be about. Um, you'll have had a bit of a clue from the image in the background. And this is sort of all developing from um, Lethal White in the previous lessons. So that idea of crime mystery uh, will be really important to the piece that you're going to be developing. Okay, so I'm going to now break down for you what your options are for this creative writing piece. So option number one would be to write a detailed description inspired by this image. So we've got our image, um, kind of looks like a, a spy piece, sort of 007 sort of vibe, a James Bond, etc. You've got this guy who is clearly um, peering through a window, perhaps watching or waiting for something significant to happen and he is armed and waiting. Looks as if he is dressed for some sort of special occasion. Um, so your first option then would be to write a detailed description based on that image. Your second option is to write a story about a supernatural event. So in that case, you do not have to be developing anything based on the image here. You can take your own ideas and formulate your own direction for that. But you've got two clear paths to choose from. I'm going to ask you now to jot some ideas down for both. So you're going to need to pause the video in a moment and make two separate mind maps or bullet point lists of ideas for both. I then want you to reflect and weigh up which you seem to be finding easier to come up with inspiration and ideas for. And you're going to then opt for, for the choice of the one that you find um, most fruitful for ideas. That is going to be the one that you are going to take forward to work with. So start it now. You need to make two separate lists, one for your description based on that image and one for a narrative about a supernatural event. Your ideas down. You need to spend approximately five to ten minutes doing this now. OK, then reflect on which one you're finding easier and that is going to be the one that we take forward. OK, so pause the video now. OK, so hopefully at this point you have now drawn up your two lists and you've reflected on, on which one you would find easier to take on as a piece of writing. Um, sometimes this is really hard to do. Don't worry if you're finding it difficult. It, especially if your talents are fairly equally matched, it can be really hard to decide where your strengths lie and which piece would be your better option to demonstrate your skills. I would suggest if you're really stuck, um, think about which you could create better imagery for. Um, so I'm not just talking about using your meta or your simile, your personification. I'm talking about which one gives you your strongest images in your mind. Which one you think you can really kind of immerse yourself in and feel like you're there as you're writing it. That is going to be your best option. The one that makes you feel like, yeah, I, I can put myself into that scene. I can imagine that. I can be there. That is going to be the one I want you to take forward. Um, so having made your choice, and if you haven't paused the video, make your mind up and then pick up again. We're going to now think about the starter here. So I'm going to ask you to create or craft a title inspired by the image there. This is only a warm up. It's not necessarily the title for your piece. I want you to practice looking at that image and creating a title inspired by it. So what makes a good title? Usually something catchy, it may well have an alliteration in it, so a repetition of letters. Um, perhaps it's enigmatic and mysterious, it gives us a hint at something that may occur um, without revealing what the plot is actually about. Okay, so take those ideas forward now and have a practice at creating a title for this image and pause the video. Right, so once you've had a go at practising creating a title based on that image, um, you can guess where this is going to go. I'm going to ask you to now have a go at creating your own title for your story, so, or your descriptive piece. So whatever ideas you were mind mapping out a minute ago, I want you to now think about what might be an effective title. 
you don't have to commit to this. This means all practicing your skills. So if you change your mind by the end of your piece and you've got a better idea for your writing and for your title, then you can always go back and change it at that point. But this is about getting your sort of creative thoughts flowing and helping you to think through um, some of the stylistic features of your writing now. Okay, so craft your title for your piece now. Pause the video and we'll pick up with the challenge in a second. Okay, we're now going to practice embedding techniques into a title. So whatever ideas you come up for for your title, I'm now going to ask you to rewrite or recreate an alternative idea using alliteration or puns, any two techniques. So it doesn't matter which two, but you're aiming for two techniques. And to think of what those techniques could be, you're referring back to apes stomp, so your alliteration metaphor, your emotive language, simile, etc. Okay, you've got notes on that in your book if you completed lesson two. So go back, check those techniques out, and then take those as the basis of your two techniques that you're going to create your title out of. And the reason that we are effectively repeating the task. Um, at least two if not three times we're creating a title, is to teach you that skill of crafting, of really taking your time to practice, come up with alternatives and then settle on the one that you think works best. Alright, so complete that task now. Okay people, so here is a reminder for you of your key techniques following a stomp. So these are the commonly used techniques. Um, it's not an exhaustive list, but it does give you a rough idea of some of the key techniques that writers will use in their creative writing. And I want to run through again with, with you that you should be trying to embed these within your descriptive or your narrative writing. Okay, so it doesn't matter which task you take them on, it's about using these skills, developing these images and these methods in your writing so that you can showcase your skill set and prove that you understand um, the, the kind of cogs that operate within a piece of writing, how writers piece together and produce um, a, a piece of work that's got a, a music to it, um, a beauty to it. And it's all done through their use of these sorts of methods. So the more that we can take from these and embed them in our own work, um, the better our chance of proving that we deserve to um, a high grade student and a talented student, okay? So obviously we've got alliteration over here. Um, the image is there because the, the kind of for sale tag that is on the seashells is to make us think that she sells seashells on, on the seashore, that alliterative kind of tongue twister, um, to remind you of the repetition of key letters uh, across the phrase or sentence or a line of poetry, okay? Like she sells seashells. We actually call that sibilance as well, that sort of repetition of the S sound, as you guys already know. Um, here we go, we've got next one personification with our unhappy looking apple because it is the attribution of human-like qualities to things which are inanimate, so things that are not living or that are of the natural world, for example, um, a tree, a piece of fruit like this. Your next one is a mate of language and as you can see from the image there, that's your use of uh, words which create like strong emotions for the reader and um, those can be negative or positive, you can go either way with it, but it's using really strong emotional words that kind of build up an emotional reaction in your reader. Um, and your next one is exaggeration, also referred to as hyperbole. Um, so exaggerating something fairly obvious technique but you, you would use that in order to kind of show the the dramatic extent to which a character is feeling for example um your next one simile using like or as like the symbol suggests there comparing two images using that key phrase like or as okay and s is also used for your sensory description, so obviously you've got your five key senses, okay, and they're, they're illustrated here, and you want to be really trying to develop those in your descriptive and your narrative writing, because those are what make it feel for your reader as if they are there with you, experiencing the world that you are creating, and the whole job of a, a talented writer is to make that world 
feel believable, to feel like the reader is really there. I mean, I, I think as somebody that enjoys reading myself, the, the beauty of reading is that you can escape your reality, you can escape our existence here, and go into this other world that offers us some sort of um, alternative to the world that we normally inhabit. And through that experience, we learn something. So it's essential for a good writer to really try and embed you within that world. And one of the ways they do that is through their use of sensory description. Um, triples is just uh, your use of threes. So often in class, I've asked you to do things like uh, use a triple of adjectives or a triple of adverbs, maybe to open a sentence in a more interesting way. Um, so for example, I might expect you to, to list them one after another, um, three descriptive words or three adjectives that will build up a greater picture of our character, for example. Okay, so it's a simple rule of three. It's you do it three times, whether you're using adjectives, adverbs, verbs, whatever you're going to um, use as your basis for that, you're repeating three times. Next one is our onomatopoeia. Please be really careful with this technique, okay? I, I've said before, but I think it's a relatively low level technique. Um, I think the most impressive writers move beyond using onomatopoeia. If you're going to use onomatopoeia well, you are imitating a sound in a way that again makes it feel like your reader can actually hear that experience. Um, so whether that would be the kind of dwunk of a, a bug hitting a window, for example, by recreating that sound, it, it feels for your reader like they, they know exactly the sound that you're describing, they feel immersed in that experience. Whereas using the kind of crash bang um, sound effects, it, it, it's a little bit cheap and easy. I think you can do better than that. Um, so use onomatopoeia, but use it really well and carefully. If you're gonna use it, you're literally trying to recreate a sound to make it feel for your reader like they're there. and. If you're going to use that, why are you not using a simile or a metaphor, for example, okay? Because if you're going to use a sound effect, it, wouldn't it have been stronger to create a visual image of what was happening? So if you're going to use this, use this really deliberately because you know that it is the best way to make your reader feel like they are involved in what is happening. Um, a higher class, a better alternative for your O from Apesom is oxymoron. And this is literally positioning two opposite words right next to each other, okay? Like um, cold heat, um, loving hate. Yeah, so you're, you're pairing up right next to each other two very opposite words or ideas, okay? So you can see here in the illustration we've got the snowflake versus the fire, two opposite concepts right next to each other and you shouldn't have any other words in between so if you're going to use an oxymoron um, in a pure way you have to put those words right beside each other so that the, the reader can see those opposite concepts are being joined together. Your next one, um, good old favourite of metaphor and um, illustrated by our bookworm here and it's comparing two things which can't which in a way that isn't literal. Um, so if I say that it's raining cats and dogs or somebody's a bookworm, um, they, those are not literal things, they are figurative, meaning you wouldn't actually see that in the real believable world. Um, it's an image that we're creating to you pass on a bigger concept. And interestingly, raining cats and dogs is also what we call an idiom, which is a well-known phrase that doesn't really make any logical sense, but we know what it means. It's got a kind of common usage that we all understand. Okay, and the final one over here is a pathetic fallacy. Um, you will now all be bored with me getting fed up with people getting this uh, idea of a pathetic fallacy wrong. So people often think that it's when the weather foreshadows something that's going to happen. Um, for example, in Macbeth, people often cite uh, descriptions of, of the the weather um, when we meet the witches and we've got the thunder and lightning and the roar and rain. People think that this is um, foreshadowing the emotions or the events that are going to occur and they wrongly refer to it as pathetic fallacy. They're right that it is foreshadowing. It is only the pathetic fallacy if the weather or something from the natural world is given human emotion in the description. So as our symbol here shows um, that the cloud is perhaps crying with grief um, at what it witnesses lower on earth. 
okay? Now that would be pathetic fallacy because I'm giving the cloud emotion, a human characteristic of emotion, and it always has to be emotion. So it's the attribution of human emotion to something from nature. Right, so those are your techniques. Now these are the things that I'm going to be looking for you to try and develop and include in your creative writing as part of this lesson. Um, if you are uh, keen to try and make sure that you are demonstrating in your work that you understand what these are and that you can use them, I would take a minute now to pause the video and plan out at least five of these um, in full sentences that you could use to answer our question. And I'll go back to that now to remind you what we're doing. Right, so let's look back at your task then. So you're either writing a detailed description inspired by that image there, that kind of crime spy kind of um, genre uh, image of this man who looks as if he's waiting for some sort of event to kick off. Um, or you're going to be writing a story about a supernatural event, okay? Um, so you're going to now decide which of those you're going to go with. Go back, look at those ape stomp techniques and try and plan out five sentences that you could embed and use in your creative writing that use those techniques. Doesn't matter which five you go for, um, just choose a five to develop now. Pause the video, get that done and I shall see you on the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to interject now for anyone that is really stuck and is thinking, Miss, I can't do this without you talking me through some of the ideas like we would in class. Um, so here are some ideas that you could develop if you are really um, like at a point where you're thinking, I just don't know what direction to take this in. So we're going to start by talking through what you could do if you're going to work with a descriptive piece. So as I was saying earlier, you can see here from our image that this looks as if he is some kind of spy, um, possibly. An alternative idea might be that he is a wealthy man. He feels like his house is perhaps under threat. Perhaps he has detected some sort of neighbour out there. You can describe it with any character background you like. So just because you are writing to describe does not mean that you don't you can't create a kind of character profile for this for this individual in our image. So the image provides you with the focus on the character. So you're free to add imaginatively any backstory ideas that you've got about who this man might be to help you in your description. So if I was working on the idea that this is maybe some um, rich, successful businessman, he is looking out of his window cautiously um, because he has heard a noise and it is late at night. He should have been joining his um, wife and his friends for some sort of party, but he is nervous that somebody is um, planning something against him, perhaps to break into his house. I, I would use that as my kind of background information in my head as a writer, and then I would base my description upon that. So when I'm describing him, I would really focus in on his eyes and his concerned look in his eye. Um, so I might describe the way that the man stares out of his window with an intent look of apprehension fixed upon his face. Um, I might describe the way that the slats of his uh, blind here um, create a kind of, um, it's almost like bars across his face. Um, so I might say that, that the slats form a, a rhythm of bars across his face from shadow to light. Um, yet his eyes were lit, barely distinguishable from, from the rest of his form, and yet so intent. So I, I would really home in on the details that I'm seeing, but I'm using my background imagined ideas about who this man is and what his context is to help me to, to find the right words for it. Okay. So if you're writing to describe, think about visually what you can see. And I'd use like the sentence starters of the man. So, the man um, casually flicks one of the blinds up and um, placing his second finger in the middle. You know, you want to tr try and really home in on the detail, but you're describing it from that um, third person perspective of the man. Okay. On the other hand, for those of you that are trying to come up with your narrative ideas, your story writing ideas, um, then you've got you've got a much kind of bigger challenge in a way because your scope is so much wider. The image gives you something really specific to concentrate on and to focus on and, and to go back to if you're finding things difficult.
difficult. Whereas for those of you that are going to go for your narrative or your story writing, um, the challenge is to try and get this idea of supernatural event in. Um, and I hope when you were planning out your ideas, you were thinking really specifically about that key word there, the supernatural. And I think personally, if I was going to be writing about this as a supernatural storyline, I'd be working with a kind of sci-fi genre. I would imagine that the light that the man um, perhaps sees, because you can still draw upon the image for ideas, might be um, from some sort of um, strange object that is in the sky on the horizon. Um, and I might develop this idea of a, a seed natural event which seems to be some sort of alien life force or some sort of um, inexplicable event that is occurring. Um, you can take that in any direction you want. You might pick up on the sort of um, other world alien kind of side of this for sci-fi. You might take it into a kind of mystical or magical world where, you know, perhaps in the sky there isn't just one moon, there are two. Perhaps it's some sort of strange behaviour that he's watching happening on the street, as if people have been sort of programmed or their their brains have been taken over and they're they're gathering on mass in some sort of strange psychological, um, inexplicable behaviour like that. So, and personally, I I think that the second one is more exciting, but it's a much harder one to come up with. Those of you who need a pushing and a challenge, I would challenge you to have a go at that. Those of you that are lacking in confidence with this, try and work on the descriptive and base it on the image you see there. You're using third person, say the man or he, okay, and you're describing what you can see, what it looks like, really homing on details. So like, um, you know, the, the kind of menacing blackness around him almost engulfs him, etc. All right, guys, so let's move on and now look at how you plan out your piece. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through a trick that you can use to help you to plan a narrative um, or a descriptive piece of writing now. Um, so this can be used for either task, it doesn't matter which one you're working with. And I'm going to talk you through like how you can map out what your paragraphs will be about. You're going to need to copy the circles down into your book as a reminder about the structure here. Okay, so the acronym we use to remember this is FACES. Um, so FACES stands for what each of your paragraphs will focus on. So as you can see there in FACES, you have five major paragraphs that I'm going to guide you through how you can develop your writing um, for based on this structure. So the F in FACES, if we look at our first circle here, um, can stand for focus on the character or an object. So if you're describing, you might be describing the look on the face of the man in our image. Um, if you are writing your narrative, your storyline ideas, you might be focusing on the character's thoughts or who he is or giving us some sort of background about who, who your major character is. Okay, and that'd be your first paragraph. Really detailed description of your character, your focus on your character. And that's the F, focus on the character. Okay, so that would be paragraph number one. Paragraph number two would be your second circle here, and as you can see from that, it is a focus on action. So if you think of the second A there, so faces action, um, action would be like either a moment of action that happens, so the man suddenly turns, hearing a noise from within the house, um, his blood runs cold, for example. You're describing um, a change in event and an action that happens. OK, if you are writing to describe, um, describe an action you can see him doing, whether that's his intense stare or whether that's the way that he's pulling the blinds apart in our image in order to get a better look at the, the street. Um, perhaps you might describe like the action of his clock on his watch ticking. You might describe some sort of other action that is happening. And you can add details beyond what you can see in the image. So if you want to describe like the action of what you can see happening out on the street, you could do that for your second paragraph, as long as it is describing um, an action or event that is occurring. And obviously, if we are describing an action, then the key vocabulary that you're going to be needing to build for your second paragraph is going to be your vocabulary of verbs, say your doing words, and your adverbs, the words that describe how those actions are happening. 
Okay, so those are your first two paragraphs. Now we're going to look at paragraph number three. So paragraph number three, as you can see from faces here, is our C. And that is a contrast. So when I say contrast, I'm looking at creating two opposite ideas. And so if you are doing your descriptive piece and you're thinking about that image of a man looking out of the window, um, then your contrast might be between the light that falls upon his face and the shadows that are around him. Those are opposite ideas and they contrast their opposites for one another. So that might be the basis of my third paragraph because I want to develop contrast. Another contrast you might develop, um, for example in a story, um, might be a contrast between his character and another character, um, or between his feelings and what he can see happening in the world beyond him. So it's any point of contrast like black versus white, um, or of sadness versus joy. It can be emotional as well as physical contrast that you are describing, but that should be the focus of your third paragraph. Your fourth paragraph is E, which is an emotive description. This is pretty much what it says on the tin. So in your fourth paragraph, I want you to really zoom in on an emotional description. If you are doing your descriptive piece, you can still describe what you imagine the emotion of the man might be. So you could still describe how you think um, apprehension is his key emotion. That's like fear, you know, the sense that something's about to happen that he is fearful of, okay? So it might be that you really zoom in on how that manifests for him physically, so he can feel the, the sweat coming, seeping from his pores. He might feel that his eyes are straining and his ears strain to hear what he might be looking at out on the street. Um, those would be also emotional, especially if you can dial up that sense of fear, his heart pounding in his chest. Um, that sickening feeling rising in his throat, okay? If you're doing it just uh, as a narrative rather than as a description, then your emotion might be that you give us a real insight into what your character is feeling at that moment, just like I've done for the description. And um, you may also want to look at um, bigger emotions that other characters are experiencing as well. Um, they, they can be negative or positive, it doesn't really matter. And your final paragraph, now this is the really hard one that I, I really do need to sort of talk you through in a bit more detail. So paragraph number five is your S, which stands for symbolic ending. Um, what that means is taking an image or an object and using that to convey a much, much bigger, deeper idea and so, for example, your kind of classic symbolic endings might be something like um, a, a wounded bird that recovers and escapes and flies away. It could be a symbol of hope and recovery. Um, uh, the sun rising would be your classic example of, you know, hope of new life. Um, vice versa, you could have like the moon appearing or the sun setting as a symbol of like death or the end of life. Um, you might develop something around a natural object like a flower, a flower withering, meaning shriveling up, um, could become a sort of symbol uh, that life cannot continue in the way that you have described it so far in your description or your narrative. Um, because our image is really strongly like a film noir, like an old black and white film, um, maybe something which is crime related, and I might take the image of shadow and use that as a kind of symbolic ending to show the character engulfed in shadow. Um, so perhaps he, it, that would be a symbol that there is no hope or that he will forever be um, forced to hide um, and not show his true identity. Um, so you can take this in whatever direction you like, but you're using either an image um, or an object um, as a way to kind of symbolise and convey a much bigger um, idea in your narrative or your description, okay? These are really tough, please do message me um, on the usual channels if you want to kind of like run through your ideas with me first or just check that your symbolic ending is correct and then you can let me know where you're at and I can give you some tips, okay? So this is like your example of a kind of perfect structure um, for your descriptive or your narrative piece. And the beauty of this is that you can use it for both and you can use this at GCSE to help you when you get there with your creative writing as well, okay? So 
hopefully this gives you an idea of what you can base each paragraph on. You can always move these circles around, so if you're like, well, I'm, I've got an idea for contrast, but actually I want to do that before my action scene, fine, move your circles around. The only ones that I, I would recommend that you leave where they are is I think that the focus on a character or an object at the start is a really strong opening, and I think that the symbolic ending kind of has to be um, the ending point. Uh, because you want to leave your reader with this bigger realisation and that's the beauty of symbolism is it allows you to do that. Um, those of you who are aiming for top grades at GCSE and want to get your skills in place now, um, real challenge is to hint at the symbol in your first paragraph over here and that way you create a circular cyclical structure to your piece because you start and end on the same kind of image or concept or symbol and that's a really clever way of, of structuring a piece of bragging so those of you that need more challenge aim for that right guys that's a lot of talking through structure your task now is going to be to plan out your five key paragraphs you want to use subheadings as you do this as you make notes and those are based around your faces from from this slide here so you want to start with your focus on your character plan out some ideas of what you would uh, focus on for either your description or your narrative. Then you're going to do paragraph two on action, paragraph three on a contrast or a contrasting event it can be as well, um, paragraph four on an emotional description and paragraph five on a symbolic ending. Okay, if this all feels way too much, choose three of those to really try and develop in your creative writing. Okay, Right, pause the video, get those planned out, and I'll see you on the next slide. Right, so by this point, you should have done the following things. You should have decided whether you're writing to describe or writing to tell a story to narrate. You should have planned out some ideas for, for whichever one you're going to work with. You should have come up with some alternative titles that you could use, and you should have worked out a rough structure for your piece and um, you should also have thought about the techniques that you could develop and practice writing some sentences using at least five of those techniques so now we're going to take all of that and kind of mash it all together to uh, start writing our first draft of our narrative or our descriptive piece so as you will know from class those of you that i teach you have seen this loads of times before and um, this is what we've done before for our writing challenges in class and what I do is I give you here in this column um, some key vocabulary that you can use to help you to develop your writing and um, these are there to just prompt ideas. You don't have to use any of them. Um, if you can use all of them, I think that's really fantastic and it shows that you're learning new vocabulary. So aim to do that, but you don't have to. If you're not going to use these, you need to develop your own set of vocab that you want to work into. I would suggest that you look the vocabulary up using a thesaurus online. Okay, so you just want to be looking up, and if I was typing it in in Google, the phrase I would be putting in is, for example, if I want a better word than silently, I'm Googling silently, followed by the word synonym, okay, and spell that with a Y, so S-Y-N, okay, so synonym, N-O-N-Y-N. Gosh, it's hard to do that without living. Um, synonym. And that will give you other words that mean the same thing, essentially. And then you can look down your list and pull out some words that you think um, sound better for your particular piece of writing. Do double check that any words that you use that are synonyms um, do actually mean what you think they mean. So even though you've read them on your list of, of alternative words for the word silently, you need to Google them and just double check that they mean what you think they mean because sometimes with synonyms you get words that almost mean the same thing but not quite and you could end up conveying a different meaning to the one that you think you're actually creating. So just double check anything that you do with that, okay? The middle column here, this is like ingredients that I want you to try and include this week with your creative writing. So these are our key skills I'm looking for. I want you to try and create a sentence that develops like the sense of sound. Um, a two sentence paragraph to build up tension or suspense metaphor personification and a sentence that starts with a verb now the reason i set you these is because i know that that will ensure that you are demonstrating a real breadth 
of methods and skills in your writing. So that's the, the reasoning why I've set you these. The more of these you've done, the even better and use the better. But it's not an extensive list. So if you wish to use some of your own um, already planned out imagery, then that's absolutely fine. But you are looking for that range. And essentially, you need to make sure that you are also thinking about sentence structures, not just imagery. Okay. And final point, technical accuracy. Check everything that you write, please. Really go over it. If you're not sure on spelling, look it up. You've got a phone, you've got the internet, hopefully. Um, look up spellings, try and correct them for yourself. Now, at this point, um, it is going to be over to you. So I've guided you through some of the ideas that you could work with. I've also taught you three techniques and structuring advice. Your job now is going to be to pull together all of your notes on your planning for this task and I want you to try and aim to write a rough plan um, of your piece, so it's just your rough draft. You will be finishing that for this lesson in the time remaining. You want to try and spend at least 20 minutes working on that today. Um, for our next lesson I'll talk you through how you write it all up in your final version and then we'll talk through self reflection work. Okay guys, best of luck. I really can't wait to read some of these. Um, really looking forward to the diversity that I think you're going to produce in your writing here. Okay, great stuff. Enjoy it. Try and have some fun with it. Um, and I shall see you on the other side. Bye.